So Andrew is a fellow Turk. Um, he has spent most of his professional career working for, owning, and consulting with small businesses. For the past several years, he has consulted startups and emerging companies and has seen the mistakes that entrepreneurs make that can have significant business ending consequences down the road. Andrew understands the steps business owners need to take now to ensure their company will be viable on the other side of COVID. Andrew is currently the Director of Operations Support at OhMyGreen.com, and I encourage you to visit that website, as well as his consulting um, at Fractional COO. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Andrew. Hey everybody, I'm glad you could join. Looks like we've got a decent sized group, so uh, hopefully I won't embarrass myself. Um, and so let's get started. Who I am? Uh, I've spent the last 20 years in operations and sales leadership. Uh, what I enjoy really doing is building scale and process to make systems grow. Um, and why should you listen to me? Well, this is the third recession of my professional life. Um, and I can give a lot, I think I have a lot of advice to take it out of the other side. Um, is the kind of scope of what I've done is business for the last, at, at, when I was at Atmosphere in three years, we took it from a $4 million to an $8 million company. I then went on to found Terashita, a blockchain based startup that was looking at improving the spice trade in India. After that, I've worked with fractional COO with multiple startups and multiple verticals to build business and revenue operations. And I also run the Siler Fund, which is a nonprofit that gives five figure grants to the library and arts community. Who I am not though, and this is the disclaimer I have to give, I am not a tax professional, I am not an accountant, and I'm not a lawyer. If you have specific questions involving those things, I would encourage you to talk to a professional in that field. I'm also not you. My experiences may vary with your experiences, and we're all really bright people, happy to chat about things, but what I think is the right answer may not be the right answer for your particular situation. So, we all remember the movie Aladdin. Jafar, the scene where they're getting the lamp for the cave. You've heard the golden rule, boy. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. First rule of recessions. Liquidity gives you choices. The most important thing is to preserve your runway. If you remember, to make another movie reference, Star Wars, where the Death Star is coming, the first one, where the Death Star is coming around and you see the Endor and the time that the Rebel Alliance has to blow up the Death Star. As it gets closer, their choices get narrower and narrower. The more cash you have, the more choices you have. So the first thing is cut anything and everything you can. What is the critical core of your business? Who are the critical staff members? What are the critical resources you need to preserve? That's it. Everything else, let it go. You need that cash to get to the other side. Next, delay your bills. Your vendor, everybody knows what's going on right now. Everybody's in the same boat. Your vendors know and understand. Call people up, say, hey, I can make a partial payment. Hey, I can pay you in a month but conserve that cash. And what I think you'll find is that if you actually have the cash, almost everything is negotiable. I'm right now working with a number of vendors to do payment plans. And the fact that we can say, hey, I can give you half of this right now if you give me six months to pay the other half, puts me ahead of three quarters of the businesses who are like, I've got nothing. I can't do anything. And so people are willing to work with you. Always preserve, as best you can, a 12 to 18 month runway. We don't know what this is gonna look like, whether there's going to be a double, double W uh, dip on this, whether this is gonna go L-shaped. Things will return, but if you're not there to be part of the return, you can't win. And so really, everything is negotiable. Negotiate with your people, hold on to what you need to hold on to. Loyalty pays dividends. Look at loyalty two ways. Internally, B 
be have financial honesty with your staff. If they hear nothing from you about what's going on, they're going to assume the worst case scenario and they're going to start looking for alternatives for them. You could lose critical people if they think you're going under next month, but you in fact have runway for six months. Don't have to give them all the details, but you do need to give them the big picture of what's going on. A little goes a long way. I know of several people in the hospitality space right now that have gone to their staff and said, look, you know and I know there's no events right now. We can't pay you. What we can do is we can cover your health insurance for the next four, we can furlough you and cover your health insurance for the next four months. And the employees are very appreciative. They're like, you're taking care of me and my family. I, you know, rather than just throwing us out in the cold, this little bit makes a huge difference. It takes a worry off my back. And that means that employee is going to be there on the other side when you're like, we're starting up again. They'll remember, hey, you know what? You covered my health insurance. Think about in-kind support. Again, I know a number of companies in the food service space that are telling their staff, hey, we've got leftover food. Take it home for your family. Do you know somebody? Again, it's it would be waste otherwise. It would be expended otherwise. But you're building that like you should already have, but you're then building on top of that loyalty that you have with your team. They will make the sacrifices to support you if you show them that you care. And the final piece of this is really think about getting your employees involved and help having them help come up with the solutions. I was just reading an article the other day in the Washington Post about how this 400 person manufacturing company the entire shop floor voted to go to four day weeks rather than laying off 20% of the staff. Let the employees come up with creative solutions and you get the buy-in to make the cuts you need without any of the bitterness. Externally, preserve your relationships. Vendors need to eat too. Don't go killing that goose that lays the golden eggs. For example, we have a technology provider. We are making sure to make the payments to that technology provider right now because I need their devs to be working on the next version of my software. If I don't pay them, they, do, they fall apart and then I've got a useless product. Start thinking about who are the suppliers and vendors who are most loyal to you versus who is just transactional. I would much rather, I would suggest that you preserve the ones that are loyal. That loyalty works. If you can get them something, they will take care of you. Business is relational. Similarly, who are your most loyal clients? Can you go to them, give them a little honesty and say, hey, can I get you to prepay half of the next three months? I'll give you a credit. Work out something like that. Again, build that relationship, you can see more cash coming in the door. And then finally, what does this look like on the other side? If you really burn a vendor or you really burn a client, are you going to need them in 12 months? Because they, if they're there, they will remember. Take care of everybody and they take care of you. It takes a village. Part of this is don't be a turtle, be a terp. Don't be a turtle. Hiding never helps. We're all in the same boat here. The economy came to a crashing stop. People understand that you can't make full payments right now. People understand that it's difficult. They are willing to work with you if they know what's going on. If you keep dodging those bill collectors phone calls, if you keep hiding from your employees when they ask, hey, how are we looking on payroll? They're going to get scared. They're going to start taking more and more drastic action because they're not hearing anything from you. Silence scares the team. So talk to those bill collectors. Odds are they want to talk with you. Like I said earlier, they'll, they'd be happy to work out a payment plan, but you don't know until you talk to them. Talk to your team. Be like, look, we know we're good for three payrolls, and then it might be a question mark, but at least we're good for the next month. And people are like, okay, that's one load of stress off. 
I can help focus on winning the thing that will get us to two months down the road. Talk to your peers. One of the things I'm really happy about is I'm part of a group called Operators Guild. That's a bunch of seasoned operations and finance professionals here in the Bay Area. Lots of advice and support there. Somebody built a PPP forgiveness calculator and posted it. Somebody else was like, hey, does anybody know anybody issuing venture debt right now? Four recommendations came out. You have a professional network. Don't hide from them. Again, we're all in the same boat and they can help you and you can help them. You don't have to struggle through this alone. So we've talked a little bit about the foundations that will get you survival. Now let's talk about how to work with that. First rule of sales, you don't sell umbrellas on a sunny day. You do, however, sell parasols on a sunny day. What are you doing right now to meet the needs of your clients? For instance, at Oh My Green, what we instituted was a snack from home program. Most of our business is workplace snacks and coffee. We started hearing from our clients, because everybody's at work from home, hey, you know, our programmers are all back to like Red Bull and Ho-Hos, and they're getting really angry. And we're like, you know, we can put together a care package with a bunch of healthy snacks and have it to their door next week. Clients are like, wow, that sounds awesome. So we started doing it. It was a win-win for everybody. We got our minimums from our clients. They got happy employees who were like, our employer cares for us. Look, I got this awesome box of snacks. So you have all kinds of pictures on LinkedIn and Facebook of people with their snack boxes. And we got to bleed down all of the inventory we had in our warehouses. That's a food product, so it's an expiring inventory. We're utilizing it. What can you do to meet the new needs of your current customer? How do you deal with, okay, they were in an office, now they're at home. What can we do to match that? They provided this service, now they provide this service. How do you keep those current customers? And the other part of this is, what can you meet the current needs of your new customers? Well, guess what? In and of building this snack from home program, we now have an e-commerce platform. And so sometime in the next month or two, we're gonna go live on full e-commerce and anybody could order a box for Stack From Home. We've got new customers out of a pivot. So think closely about what you're doing. What are the underserved needs of your current customers? What are the underserved needs of your new customers? And how can you use this opportunity to move into that space? One of my favorite jokes. Two runners in the woods, bear starts chasing them. One stops to tie his shoes. The other one looks at him and says, what are you doing? There's a bear chasing us. First one says, I don't gotta outrun the bear. I just gotta outrun you. There's another, there is an, uh, another side to this one. Not every business is going to make it to the other side. The customers will still be there. Based on my experiences in the 01 and 08 recessions, you see 20 to 30% growth on the other side. Because even if you've lost 30% of your customers, if you get half of your failed competitors' customers, that's 120%. Think about that loyalty. Think about that runway. If you can get to the other side, the business is huge because all you have to do is outrun your competition. You don't have to outrun the bear. And we're all smart enough to outrun our competition. Take time to optimize. Right now, you know, your general ledger all clean, you know what every single charge is, your chart of accounts is perfect. How about your staffing? Do you need six people to do that task? Could five do it? What's social distancing gonna do to that model? What about your processes? My personal least favorite phrase is, but we've always done it that way. Are you using the most efficient processes? Right now, everything is on pause. And all those little things that you had as a business owner where you said, oh, I'm gonna get to that when I have a moment. Oh yeah, we'll totally take care of that when I have like two days to look at that. Guess what? You've got the time right now. 
take time every day to dig in and figure out how to do it better. You've got the pause, take the time. Dive into your staffing, dive into your accounting, dive into your process. I don't care if you're ISO 9001 certified, like there is more optimization that you can squeeze out of that sponge. Take the time to do it now because you will come out the other side leaner, more efficient, more optimized, and better positioned to win all of those customers from your failed competitor. Boundaries. When we get on an airplane, they tell you, put the oxygen mask on yourself first, then take care of your kid. Your business is your kid. Stress makes for poor decisions. When your bedroom is your office, is your 24 seven uptime, Slack is bonging, emails are coming in, and you know what, there's nowhere to go, you're just gonna fall into a work rut. This will burn you out. Set boundaries. Your priority should be to your family. Your priority should be to your friends. Your business is here and it's a priority, but it's not the only one. Take the time to take care of yourself because stress makes you stupid. Do something for yourself. Give yourself a win. For me, I found this uh, card catalog by the side of the road. I've spent the last two weeks restoring it. And so, you know what? Even if everything else goes completely sideways and wrong, I will be able to go in and say, hey, cool, look at my new side table. I did this during COVID. Give yourself a little win. You've earned it. And with that, I'm gonna wrap up and I hope there's a lot of questions. Thank you so much for that. Go ahead, everyone, and um, use the chat feature and enter your questions. Thank you, Dana. <laughs> You're biased. <laughs> Uh, All right. Do you see that uh, question, Andrew? What did you do to survive the 2008 um, recession? Yeah. So in 2008, I was head of sales at Atmosphere. Uh, we did a couple. Of the, we did a couple of things. The first was we made uh, we, we had layoffs. Um, fortunately, Atmosphere's business model involved a significant amount of sort of casual labor that was project-based. And so with no projects, uh, that labor just went off the books. But then within the uh, sg &A function, we cut about a third of the positions and there were uh, pay cuts uh, across the board um, to conserve cash. And then, like I said, we delayed a number of vendor payments um, and we spent a lot of time working with our larger clients to say, okay, what can we do? Um, the other big piece of it was that whole uh, serve the needs of your new customer. In 2008, DC became a much bigger hub for lobbying, and there were a number of events that came to DC specifically for that, and what the customers were telling us, because these were the big banks getting their bailouts, we want to have a party, but we can't have anybody know that we're having a party. And so they would do it in undisclosed locations. The staff all had to sign NDAs. We had to comply with all of the new federal lobbying rules on food and everything else. So like there was a pivot involved there um, in terms of how we structured stuff and what we competed for. Uh, and then, you know, two of our major competitors in 08 did not have the runway and crashed and burned. And so on the other side, I started getting calls from people that I had been trying to get a hold of for two years who started calling, oh, you know what, I've got something in like two months and XYZ was gonna do it and now they can't because they're not here anymore, can you do it? Yeah. 
So my book of business over that time period went negative by about 20, 25% in 08, but in 09 went up by about 40%. So like I said, get to the other side, maintain those relationships and you will win. Natalie, do you want to yeah. prioritize these or? Yeah, all right. So the next question we have here is, you have given us some great strategies for specific businesses. In, in our opinion, what types of businesses, industries are in greater jeopardy of coming back? I guess in your opinion was the question, what yeah. types of businesses and industries are in greater jeopardy of coming back? Uh, anything that involves prolonged face-to-face -face contact or large groups. I'm very glad I got out of the event industry four years ago, five years ago now, because they are in for a long, cold, dark, dark winter. Um, I think a lot of personal care, I think a lot of um, retail is gone and it's, it's not coming back. I would be curious and I think that there are businesses like there are things that are going to come back but far more automated i think that the amazon go grocery store model is going to take over from the traditional grocery store model fairly quickly the the fewer touch points um i think that in things like uh the food supply chain you know we're seeing all this stuff with meat shortages right now and everything else i think you're going to see the rise of the robots because you can't, you can't hang and cut pork and cows on six foot distancing. It doesn't work. You, you, know, you have to spend a billion dollars building a new processing plant. And if you're gonna do that, you might as well roboticize two thirds of it to avoid all the other costs. So I, those, those are the ones that I think are most obvious. Um, I think the whole energy sector is having its own travails, but I think that's more of a function of internal dynamics there than anything else and i think it's going to be a long pause before that comes back and i think tourism is gonna hurt for a couple of years and then it'll come back in a big way because people who have been deferring vacations for four years are going to go but not on a cruise ship <laughs> <laughs> how were you able to break into e-commerce in a month that seems like a big pivot so it's i, I would say that's a two-layered answer we had existing clients who have, you know, had, they sent home a thousand people to work from home. And so building the process to get a thousand bi-weekly boxes out the door, then we got the process for e-commerce. Now, if we choose to go that route, it's a function of the advertising and sales side of e-commerce. So I didn't think, I don't think we've gone fully e-commerce. What we've done is taken a traditional workplace micro kitchen support model and pivoted it into a work from home support model, which has then given us a gateway to e-commerce. Okay. All right, next question. Um, what about Care Act money? um did you take any care act money or apply for it we, we did receive a ppp loan um how would you balance the need to optimize staffing with the honesty with staff concept can you honestly reassure them that everything's good for three months while also seeing who can be de-staffed that's the tricky part i think that I, that's that's where I'm, I'm a big believer in mostly transparency that i think if you go to the staff and say we're going to need to reduce payroll by 20 percent and people kind of know which departments are are, are going to go um, you know, like if <laughs> our recruiting department, like any company's recruiting department very early on realized there was not going to be any recruiting for a while. Um, whereas, you know, your core, your head of sales, unless he's very, very pricey or she has a distorted comp package, knows that her earnings are going to be down because she's not 
selling, but she's probably essential to maintain those customer relationships. And so I think being honest in the big picture of we are going to need to make cuts to survive, but not specifically saying we're going to need to make cuts to survive. So you, you, and you, you're out. Um, and I think there's a, there's a big piece with kindness. Like there's a lot of, you know, uh, it was one of the scooter companies is now notorious throughout the entire Valley for laying off 400 people on a pre-recorded two minute zoom call. Nobody's going to work for them again. Um, whereas if you've had, if you haven't had a chance, read Carta's CEO's layoff message. It is probably the best layoff message I've read. He, you know, they got a severance, they got healthcare. He made it really clear that it was not because of their performance. It was because of external factors. And, you know, you, you, can, you can do it with kindness. You still have to do it, but you can do it with kindness and honesty. So I think you just touched upon this a, a, a bit, but um, you know, overall, do you think it's better to cut employees from the bottom um, and keep your core staff paid the same or keep everyone and cut everyone's pay? If your employees find out that you laid off most of your frontline workforce, but your top performers didn't take any haircut, you will have a very toxic business. Um, back to my atmosphere days during the 08, no, it was the 01 recession. Uh, we used to do a, a big ball for children's hospital and BB King played that, that the ball that year. And he auctioned the guitar he played. It was not Lucille, the Lucille, but it was one of the Lucilles. And my boss, the owner, one of the owners of the company bought the guitar. We all know he bought it. It was 20 something thousand dollars. Three weeks later, he said, because of financial constraints, nobody's getting a raise this year. Needless to say, there was not a lot of loyalty felt by the employees towards the company for a couple of years after that. And so, yes, I mean, I think that in a brutal, in a land of brutal honesty, it is easier to replace an entry level or a bottom level person than it is a senior person. However, if you're going to make cuts, you need to make it clear that leadership is taking a 30% or a 50% haircut as well. Because especially if you're the company owner, like yeah, and you see this a lot in the cor like the big corporate world of there's a lot of CEOs that are making it clear that they are not taking a salary this year. And, and that's the kind of thing that has to be seen. What macro changes do you think is going to occur? Is stay at home going to be the new normal? Uh, so actually, Ryan, I think we were, we were chatting about this before, before the call. I think that this is going to be a lot like 9-11, and there's going to be an overcorrection. I think this fall is going to be way too much work from home, no gatherings, no meetings, no travel, no nothing. And people are going to get fed up because they can't get things done, and you will see a return to a new normal that does involve hopefully the end of the open office because I hate open offices. Um, a, a better thought on work from home. I think that there are companies that have held on to work from home because they like to count beans, not because there's a productive need to prevent employees from working from home. I think you're gonna see a greater work from home. I think you're gonna see a greater flexibility in scheduling. Um, at the same time, I think that having a 10% unemployment rate going into the next year or two, especially being out here in the Bay Area where people, you know, nobody under the age of 32 has seen a recession before, and they are used to just working for a job for a year, quitting, hopping to their next job, getting a 20% raise, and then going to Bali for two, year, two months, and then coming back and finding, like, that's going to stop because that option isn't there anymore. And so I think that you will see a greater degree of employee tenure and engagement 
in a way that you haven't seen in, I think, a younger generation. Um, as an experienced salesman, what would be some of your recommendations for a fellow salesman? First is know the pulse of, like, really have a pulse on your customer. Um, that, you know, you, you look, at, look at your pipeline and be brutally honest with yourself. You know, salesmen by nature are optimistic. But if you're scoring this one as a 75% probable or was scored as a 75% probable at the end of February, it's probably a 25% probable right now. Or it may be 75% probable at half the deal size. And so go through that pipeline with a fine comb, be brutally honest, look at, look at the relationships that are transactional versus look at the relationships that are consultive and focus very closely on those. Use, use your unofficial connections, find out what the financial picture, like how people are feeling inside that company. Because it could be that they're talking all big about closing this $5 million ARR deal, but the CFO knows that, you know what, there's actually not a deal and they may be going out of business in three months anyways. And what, you know, like when salespeople talk to salespeople, all sorts of great castles get built. And so brutal honesty is the first. The second is, like I said, are you selling umbrellas on a sunny day or are you selling parasols? What do you have right now in your toolkit, your company's toolkit, that customers need? That's what you should be selling may not be the highest margin, it may not be the best performer, but if that's what people are buying right now, sell the people what they're buying, because that will create, build and create the relationships for you to sell them the good stuff on the other side. Um, so according to the poll, most of the, um, most of the people on the um, video right now on this, uh, in this event, they have had their businesses for 10 plus years and the smaller margin is about startups. The, all the great information and tips that you gave today, do they apply across the board or are there things that maybe startups should be doing a little differently than let's say our more seasoned um, business owners? Yeah, so I, I think I would split a, a venture backed startup from a VSB, small business or if the, if, if, so for those who aren't clear on that a venture back startup is something that there are outside investors who are willing who are backing an idea and willing to tolerate significant losses while you build the business whereas a vsb is a very small business that's probably a couple of people you or a couple of people that are growing you know in a niche and you're bootstrapping yourselves. Uh, venture back startups, first thing I would say is read the black swan letter that Sequoia put out. Uh, I think it was Sequoia uh, three months ago. Um, they were the ones who also did the end of the good times presentation in 08. I think it's spot on. You are going to find it very, very hard right now to find any venture capital or venture debt unless your business model is telemedicine remote work enablement or possibly mental health other than that it's going to be real tricky and so that this is the one where if you've done your raise look at your cash flow and slash to the bone because you need 18 months like sorry or you may need to say quit and start talking to your lawyers right now about how to quit. Because if you're not, if you're, if you're two years in, you're not profitable and you're not, you don't have the traction and you thought you were going to survive to the next round, you're not. I'm sorry. Um, if you are a VSB and you are bootstrapping your way as like a consultant or you know a neighborhood hardware store or whatever it is. Be really honest with yourself. I think you need to look at 
is what I'm doing marketable in 12 months? You know, like I was saying, I don't think retail is going to be there. I, you know, so if you just opened a slushy store, you may not, you may not make it. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that. Um, if on the other hand, you are a lead green energy consultant, yes, there will be a demand for you in a year. Now it will be a reduced demand because I think construction is going to be down, but figure out who your key players are and take the time right now to really work on your marketing, your positioning and your relationships. Everybody's at home and bored. Call people up and talk to them, not just about work. Build those relationships. Do we have any additional questions? Great. Well, um, Andrew, um, thank you so much. This was absolutely phenomenal. Um, additionally, if you want to maybe share some maybe, you know, maybe a few more resources that you may have, or I know you have your email here on the screen. So, you know, please make sure if you'd like to, con I'm putting that out there, Andrew. Um <laughs> please, if you have specific questions, I'm, I'm always willing to chat. Uh, so hit me up on my email or my LinkedIn. Love to connect with you. Love to share ideas. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email to this. So we hope that you really enjoyed this. I know I learned a lot. Um, so thank you so much for that, Andrew. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Great guys. work, Andrew. Well thank done, you, sir. Chris. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.